this was a wedding present from nine years ago almost. Started to see all this coating come off. Don't yeah, like so it. he had to quit using it because that Teflon wound up in his. So you saw the Teflon pan at the beginning of this uh, when we showed up at the blacksmith shop. We thought it was only fitting to bring the pan out and um, we're gonna take care of the Teflon pan. So let it rip, guys. We made it to the blacksmith shop. We're right here in uh, near Hocking Hills, Ohio. We're at Lockhart Ironworks. Um, this is gonna be a pretty cool process because we're butchers by trade. Now we get to be blacksmiths. So there's a lot of forgery going on in there. There's, is that the right word? Forging. No. Forging's the word. <laughs> there's a lot of forging going on in there. There's coal, there's smoke, there's fire, they're bending metal. We're gonna get this process going. In the meantime, there's Tell a little bit Tell us about of... that pan, Dan. This was a wedding present from nine years ago almost that we used regularly until we started to see all this coating come off. Premium pan, nice wedding gift, but it, uh, yeah, we quit using it because don't yeah, like it. Yeah, so he had to quit using it because that Teflon wound up in his, in his gut. So introduce the Bearded Butcher themed 10 inch dual handle. Now those are bees. Those are shaped like bees for Bearded Butcher. This is US Forge Steel. Now steel predates cast iron and it has many advantages. Um, it's less porous, it's lighter. It's going to have excellent re heat retention. And what's more, these that we're making today that come out of Lockhart's blacksmith shop have a triple lifetime guarantee. So this pan will literally last your lifetime, many lifetimes. This pan will be as long around as long as you need to put anything really over a fire. So let's get started making some of these awesome pans. got five of the skillet plates here. Let's get it pressed. You got some we're gonna we're gonna increase production by doing two at a time. your hand under there.
this radius with that. So you don't want it like this. See that? That, that will make it. These pans come out of the press and they've got some imperfections here. So we're gonna go ahead and take that wrinkle out of this pan. How we do, boss? What do you think? Anything need hit again? This is a job we're gonna hire a blind person to do. Cause, you, <laughs> cause it's better to do a blind. That no, right here is only one. Feel it. Okay. Oh yeah, I, I see it. it. Tilt it back a little bit. You want to yeah, yeah. match the. So that was a no go. Like Side, am I going on this side? Yeah. Are you, okay, you want to hold it? Are you dead serious? Yeah, I'm dead serious. How you want to hold it this? like that. <laughs> You're big and strong. And patient. Really you want to hold it flat. You want to hold it flat. Hear how that sound changes? All right. <laughs> My arm is dead tired. <laughs> Just hit it right. Hit it right there. You'll hear a nice solid sound. Hear that? You want to keep it flat right there and you'll hear a nice solid sound. Go ahead. We uh, now use the lathe work because as much as we try to, by hand, keep these as level as possible, we will sometimes get a high wall on one side and a low side on the other. And before, you know, some people can use that, but mm -hmm. we like to give people just the as nice, best, yeah. even. Exactly. Gotcha. So, we're going to set this in here for you. In the lathe it goes. In it goes. Self adjust and got that nice and tight. So, all right, when you're ready, just this handle right here, just bring it in nice and slow. Okay. I'll get it. There we go, give you a little kickstart. Roughly centered, and then you set the tension with that. Make sure you get a click out of that. Hold on, it's okay. it's already low. Let's make it a little better. Okay, try that. And then the pedal on the floor makes it spin, and just uh, just try and uni right yep, yep. uniformly go from inside to outside. And you'll feel it. Like once you stop again, you can feel the burr and notice where you need a little bit more. transition pretty rapidly really slowly really slowly yeah, so I can do it in like one pass I'll start on the outside and just barely move rotating to the inside and by the time I'm there it's done it's like pottery just like clay just move it real slow or wood turning I take the heads off of animals for a living Doug. okay so, so <laughs> let me try to, let me try to get this in another way I noticed you had your hand up here you yeah, you I like to do it. that that one, yeah, so that my hand doesn't wiggle everywhere. Now I assume you don't want to hit the pan. Right. And you don't want to hit the lower. 
You don't want to hit this you either. You don't want to roll it too far. Well, you're gonna you're gonna bridge if you hit that. So if you come like this, you know, if you know where your wheel is, then you won't hit it. So if you get that outer lip, you feel it. And feel a lot it. of pressure. The more pressure you put, the faster that cuts. Did you show him? You want to show him? I can do it one again. I can show you one. Yeah, and demo then. one. We'll yeah. So I'm gonna run the bottom edge of the wheel right there to get that. And super slowly, I'm gonna transition. just to clean it up because I was pretty confident I already had my bevel done on the first one. Feel that. That's done. Yeah. So sw real slow and a good amount I of I think pressure. it was the setup. The guy that put it in there. That could be something. Is that you? <laughs> yeah, hold it right flat up wrinkle. against it. When you touch the top and the bottom oh, one, yeah, there's a gap there. I see. So if you just get the wheel up on the top one, you can really come under that edge there that you were having problems with. Need another hit no, you got her now. It won't cut fast enough to cut a groove. So. Yeah. 98 to go. <laughs> Doug Lockhart, the owner and founder of Lockhart Ironworks. Our production manager, Daniel, came to one of his classes, made some of his equipment. We're starting out with this 10 inch pan because we think it works perfect. That's the one that we're doing beer to butcher theme, but we think it's the beginning of a long lasting relationship. Doug, how'd you get started in the blacksmith or ironworks business? You wanna tell us a little bit about that and what makes that pan different or better? When we first came up with the idea of cookware, there was a number of things that we were targeting on our uh, product line. One of them was a non-stick surface. In, in a long time ago in my youth, I remember having a Teflon product, coated product, and it had scratches in it. And, and in being a young boy doing the dishes for my family, I kept taking and trying to get that to be a silver finish and I thought it was baked on food and as I grew up later I realized that the Teflon had scratched off and was somewhere. It was either down the drain or in our food and uh, that made us uncomfortable. So I started thinking can there be a surface that would be non-stick that would be good for your body and then we started thinking more about cast iron. Cast iron has a weight issue but it also has a uh, an ability that it could crack if you change the temperature really fast. So we wanted to avoid that and being blacksmiths we thought we went back before uh, Civil War era when they were hand forging all of their cookware and we studied on that technology and that's what encouraged us to go with the steel. So what happens is the uh, steel compared to cast iron has the pores are much smaller so if you oil this surface it takes uh, less oil to fill those pores, which creates this nonstick surface. The other pro things we were looking for was it was a it's a little bit lighter than cast iron, but if you change the temperatures rapidly, you're not going to have a fracture problem. This is kind of interesting. Metal doesn't start even showing color till you're about at 900,000 degrees. That's why we don't touch anything. You just can't tell what its temperature is. So, for for us to move metal. We have to get it clear up into here, and you hold this with your bare hand. You're gonna, it'll be like 26 or 700 degrees in this neighborhood. You want to stay away up here because when you get into this temperature, it, it'll liquefy and it's in the bottom of your forge. And we're using a coal forge. It's been done like this for thousands of years, and that's what's cool about it. Is that this is this is very, um, it's a really super economical way of of moving metal. It's a very traditional way, and it's what everybody has really kind of leaned away from. They've gone to um, gas forges, electric, even if, even on the coal, there's electric blower. We're using a hand blower. What we do is, there's a fan in here. This is from uh, early 1900s, and as we turn this, the, the fan inside there is turning. It's shooting air on the bottom, right up through the bottom of our fire, which is like blowing on a campfire, super heat. I can get to melting temperatures in just a few seconds. It heats so fast 
that I'm going to show you the colors on these rods before we put our handles in. Now our handles are laser cut and we made a choice here. If you want me to take a straight piece of flat steel and, and do all of this work, it's going to reflect in the price. It's going to look the same, it's just going to take me an hour to make two handles compared to laser cutting them, get them to the shape, and then we're going to hand texture them so that they're round and smooth and feel good to your well, that's that marriage of old tech and new tech. Right, right. But, and it's a compromise. It's a compromise because at the end, and like I said too, the bowls, if, if you want me to take the flat thing, I can hand hammer it. After four hours of hammering, it's going to look exactly the same as what we did. The price is just going to be astronomical. So to make these affordable, we're trying to uh, make concessions. So what's going to be interesting on this handle is we're going to texture the upper and the lower of both sides of this so that it's round and it doesn't have a sharp edge. But interesting, on, this, on these two mounting places, we're only going to texture the top and not the bottom sure. because we want that to sit against the bowl with no gaps so that there's no place for food and bacteria to build up. So that's so it'll be beveled on both sides of, of this part and on this end it'll only be beveled on one side and I'll show you how to do that. So first of all I want to show you how we're going to, uh, I'll take a, just a regular cold rod and we're just going to add air to our coal. This is West Virginia coal. It's a bituminous coal. Um, it comes out of the Sewell coal vein in West Virginia and uh, they call it a smokeless coal. This is, an, this is uh, there's some, there's some cleaner coals up in Pennsylvania but it's really difficult to keep it, keep it hot enough with a hand blower. You have to have an electric blower. This is where, this is what I have used for 40 years and it's just what I used to prefer. So watch, I'm not going to use a glove. I just want to show you how hot I can get this before it has a chance to transfer up the handle. So here we are getting, we're getting close to 2200, 2300 degrees. We're at about 600 degrees. Now, as the steel gets hotter, it gets softer. So if I'm moving steel a lot with my arm and hammer, I want it to be as soft as I can. It'll get almost like clay. For us, what we're going to do is texture. We're not really going to move the metal. We're going to texture it. So we don't need to get into this bright yellow heat. See, it's a bright yellow. What color are, what, what are, what are we? We're going to be right at about 26 or 700 degrees and it has not had a chance to transfer till about right there. Now it's uncomfortable. Wow. Pretty cool. Okay, so when we go over to our anvil, it's a 300 pound anvil made in America. Um, our hammer is going to be, it, it's hard to see, but on this face here is flat and this one here is rounded. We're gonna want the rounded hammer side because what we're gonna do is we're gonna clip the edge of the metal so that we we're going to round it so watch when this comes out we're going to have the pair of tongs and we'll hold it over here so it'll be out of our way and i'm going to take the rounded part of my hammer right in the middle and i'm going to run right around the edge so what i'm going to do is break that edge over mm -hmm. all the way around then i'm going to come around on the inside then I'm going to do the outside, then I'm going to flip it over and do the same. I'm going to knock that edge off all the way around. Now I'm going to stay off of this for now. We're going to do another separate heat because we're going to run out of heat. When you lay your hammer down, you've got your working edge that way, so you don't have to look for which is flat because it's hard to tell. It's so, so when you pick this up, it's ready to go. And, and that actually, it's going to save you, what, three seconds? But we only have about 30 seconds that we can work this before we have to go back into the heat. So you got to work really fast. Yeah. In a coal fire, uh, you're working blind. We have to get it down in there in, in watch. Gas board, you can see it. It's an oven. When it's ready, you pull it out. But we can't see it. We're going to go down underneath here and it's going to disappear. And then... Uh, we just got to know where it is. We got to keep it covered up so that it can absorb heat. 
Now I'm going to create a vent hole for the gases to direct the flame. See, I just created a there's, a, there's a blast hole to let the flame. Now that's interesting, there's a hot spot in there about the size of an orange and it'll move. I can make it go back or I can make it come forward or I can make it go up and down. And that's why it's really difficult for me to teach a cold class. Nobody really cares anymore. They just want to go right to the gas. And it's kind of involved. I mean, if you're renting your home, it's hard to talk to your landlord and let you punch sure. a hole in the roof. And... All right, so check on it. You have to, that's the one thing you have to constantly check on it. So I see it up here. It's still doing all right. And this is crazy. There's only about 30, 25 seconds or so between these before it liquefies. So if you wait just a little bit longer, it, it'll be gone. Or half of it will be gone. So if you look in here, you can still see this dark shadow. See that dark shadow? It means I'm not really up the heat yet. It'll start to, it'll start to mimic its background, which is the hot coals inside. I get a lot of young people in here, hey, can I turn the blower for you? And that, even though they think they're helping, it's a timing thing. I know where it is, I know it, how, where I am in the hot spot, how many times I've turned it, when it should be ready. And if they're turning and I'm, I don't have that connection, then it's easy to melt it. So even though they want to help, it's kind of hard for them to do that. So we should be getting close. I know half of it is ready. I just want to make sure the other half is. Okay, so we're going to bring this out. Now watch, I'm going to start wherever I want. I'm going to start right here. Now when you hit it, it's going to pucker a little bit, so you got to be consistent so that you don't have this ugly edge sticking out. While I'm here, I'm just going to go on the inside too. You can see right here, this is really in a, see there's like a little dip? Mm -hmm. If I hit right on this side of that dip, watch what happens. It just, it'll, it pushes it out. That makes this line stay not lumpy. So now I'm done. Now I'm going to flip this over. And I'm gonna do the same on the other side. It only took one heat to do that. Here's the second piece. And we're up, we've got the flat edge up. I just go around again, make sure I don't have any of those inward indentations. Go down the middle. Now, on this one, I'm going to run around one of these edges, and then the bottom will be flat. So now watch, I'm going to go, we got everything rounded except this very end, and I'm just going to run around the edge. Now, uh, this... Don't worry about the holes because we have to, we drift them because in case one hammer blow would close it up a little bit, we're gonna drift it anyway, so don't worry about that. touch mark. Half of them get the heart, half of them get the anvil. So if we look at it close, we've got this, this is all textured so it feels good. This is completely flat on that edge and this edge is beveled. Mm. So that tells you what side we're going to touch mark. So we have our touch mark on the underside which is going to be this side because this is going to go against your bowl, mm -hmm. gets bent like that, so our touch mark is under here, so you have a really nice looking texture. So that tells us when we orient it. So cool. Butchering and spices have gone together for centuries. And for over a decade, the bearded butchers have sold spices. In fact, spices came out before our media came out. It began with our original blend, then Chipotle, Cajun, Hot, Hollywood, Black Butter, 
Brock, Zesty, and Cinnamon Swirl. 10 different flavors that we've expanded to now. They make meat better. We're online at beardofbutchers.com. We're also expanding into over 500 retailers. Some of our bigger stores are Rural King, Cal Ranch, and all your Great Lakes Ace stores. So look for it on the shelf at a retailer near you or go to beardofbutchers.com and get some of our spice. Tell us a little bit about, you've got three marks on here. Of course, we have the Beard of Butcher logo, but you've also got your maker's mark and then the USA stamp. Yeah, I think that's important. Made in the USA, people are really, um, leaning towards that mm -hmm. also that they can know that you can come right to the factory or the shop that made this and talk to the people that put the handle on um, that sort of thing and then this is this is our mark which is a uh, the Lockhart it's a registered touch mark for Lockhart and um, that tells you who made it and then the bearded butcher mark right in the center. And you're sourcing U.S. steel is that correct? Yes everything comes from the U.S. I had this vision of a young woman standing at the stove cooking and saying, you know, this pan belonged to my grandmother. And every time that I cook bacon in this, I, I feel like she's near. So it was important to me for heirloom. I wanted something because I believe that we live in a world right now where things are temporary and we tend to throw them away and just replace them instead of handing them down or taking care of them, handing them down to our next generation. And that's what we wanted to create. Get the pan, Spencer. Look at that. It's amazing chicken, and I know because I already ate some. <laughs> Just cooked in these Lockhart pans, and looks amazing. So yeah, we're gonna center punch a mark right there. There we go. Get the other one here. Perfect. Gonna go from here over to the drill press. And one. On the inside, the fillet's sometimes dull or just, just because it'll have these little shavings that are going to be an interference. So for that, we have come to the power tools, the little tapering bit. We're going to go inside there and just, just a little bit. And that'll just get rid of that nice and soft. Do the same thing on this side. And that's perfect. So that way this that rivet, when we put that in, we'll be able to seat there nicely, and you'll get that nice flush finish. There you go. It's not like cutting hold that, and there's always no heavy. One time for this. No, you just leave it. Come back. When we designed this piece, we did some things. We actually riveted the handles on instead of uh, spot welding them. And that also created a gap so that heat transfer is slower coming up into these handles. Um, but it also creates a joinery that will not come apart. Another thing that we spent a lot of time on was the pitch of these handles and the pitch of the sidewall, the depth and the height of the sidewall. There's a lot that goes into making one of these. <clears throat> And that's why uh, we're glad that we can make them for you guys. And uh, we have an unconditional guarantee on these forever. We, we couldn't think of anything that could go wrong with them. If, if we ever find a problem with one of these skillets, we'll either fix it or we'll totally replace it. And, that, and I talk to my children about that. When I'm gone, uh, they've, they've, they've agreed to do this forever.
nose against the glass. Where's my hat? <laughs> you guys figure out why you guys are laughing. So I can throw it up in there? Yes. Probably not with your hands. <laughs> if you're quick enough, you can. I'm not good enough for that yet. Can I use this, or is that yeah, a bad that's idea? Fine. Hold on. I would use these. You on. demonstrate. Because I'm one, and then you put the rest. I'm in. bad at this. I'm just gonna grab the side. Put it up in there. Right under those flames is where it's the hottest. Sorry about that. So, you can kind of push it in a little bit. Much? Yeah. Wow. Power hammer. All right. So, she's going to bring it right over here. So, when we take it out, you kind of want to, as soon as you pull it out, let it hang low. Because it's starting to get hot enough that you can bend, bend that steel. Especially the handles. So, just drop it down. So that middle one is at yeah 370. Go ahead for it. So there's no spots on there that she missed. Use your tongs. So there's no spots she missed. We know that it's all completely sealed. In and back out type scenario. Just kind of, you dip it in there and then you can spin it so you can grab the other arm. Usually this is like pure Sure. Now, when you go to put when you go to put an egg on there, a pancake, the oil boils a little bit and the food just floats. That's why it's non-stick. And you'd have the same thing with cast iron, except the cast iron pores are so much deeper that it takes way more oil to do this for it to be non-stick. The only way you can get around that is if you took one of our uh, angle grinder and you grind the floor of that cast iron pot, then you'd have this finish. Mm. Lodge used to do that but they had to charge a lot more money for those and nobody paid it. They discontinued it. So, hot enough that you don't want to grab it by bare hand, but, but soft enough you still move it. Exactly. So, I usually start on the bottom first just because that way when we grind this off a little bit, we're using a nice little wire wheel. So I'm gonna try to aim away from you guys, but clean up the bottom and the label. And I wish I could let you feel this, but so you can see how it's kind of catching right there. Mm -hmm. Look how smooth this, the inside is versus that edge. But that will rub off, but this is like smooth. So we're gonna just keep wiping the outside real quick. You'll see some of that fuzz catches and we'll fall with this one, takes it off. Take this rag and just kind of rub it a little bit. You'll feel how kind of how oh, porous yeah. that is. Yeah. So you can kind of feel like how that's kind yeah. of porous and just doesn't really grab. Yeah, get a feel for that. 
Oh yeah. So you feel that now. Give that a feel. That's enough just to take the very wow. top edge off. <laughs> it makes it look smooth. Yeah. So that's just. But you gotta be careful. You like you can't stack them where they'll scratch. That black will scratch. Because every time you use it, you're heating it up, adding oil, and you're making it blacker until it turns cold black. Right now it's kind of like a dull black. So you saw the Teflon pan at the beginning of this uh, when we showed up at the blacksmith shop. We thought it was only fitting to bring the pan out and um, we're gonna take care of the Teflon pan. So let her rip guys. That was Daniel's eighth. How many that, that was were fired and how many <laughs> are in hand? That was. <laughs> <laughs> That was I Daniel's wedding present. And how many years ago was it? Nine. Nine years. <laughs> I know we got four. <laughs> Let's go get it. Six. So that's where the Teflon pan ended up. You can go give it back to your wife, Dan. <laughs> Just put it in the cover. Don't tell her. <laughs> hey, she's been wa she's been wanting content. We got it for her. That's all pans are pre-season. All ready to go out the door. I think we got 35 pans going back with us today. 36. 36 pans going back. Oh, yeah. Oh. What an exciting partnership. You think about, you know, faith, family, food. That's what we always preach. Uh, you know, you think about the generations of food feeding your family in this skillet. It's it's a humbling humbling thought to think of it coming from this and blacksmith shop right here. We've got the kind of relationship that you can do on a handshake too. So that's right. absolutely. Absolutely. thank that's you important from to butchers us. to blacksmiths. We can bring you a product like this like Doug said for generations.